Thank you very much. Um, so, um, like you know, I'm all I'm here from the Kate Hamburger College, um, and I'm doing something very similar. Um, it's on human trafficking, but I'll be looking at uh, the shadow economy of human trafficking while I'm there. And um, <clears throat> what my I initially was I was kind of uh, having some uh, uh, conflict of interest when I was making a presentation here because I didn't want to, I don't want to say everything I do here because if I say it here, I don't know what I'm going to say over there. So um, I wanted us to look at just some, I just uh, will look at some challenges which um, I have gone through while doing a research in human smuggling and human trafficking in Nigeria. Um, it started, my interest in this started about over five years ago when I was doing research on conflict and conflict resolution in the Niger Delta region in Nigeria. And uh, <clears throat> at that time, um, we were looking at the gender dimension of conflict in that region. So I was looking at how women were affected by um, the conflict. And it, <clears throat> due to displacement, we found that in situations like that, traffickers um, took this opportunity of their vulnerability because people are displaced. And um, so that was what, how my interest shifted to human trafficking. So um, for today's lecture, I'm going to give you a kind of over, brief overview kind of, because first thing we need to acknowledge is that human trafficking is modern day slavery. You all know that because that's what you do here. And so with that bearing in mind, there's some things I would like to discuss, I'll give a brief background of slavery in Nigeria before I now go into my work, a, bit, a little bit of my work, and then we we'll look at some, um, some uh, what do you call it, challenges or things we should look into while doing this kind of research. I do have one or two videos, very short videos, so we can, I hope it works, we can see and then we can discuss about that. Okay. So, um, slavery in Africa was not an invention of the West. It predated the arrival of uh, the Europeans by centuries and it still continues to date. Slavery is institutionalized in African history from ancient times and even in Nigeria. Slavery is an ancient system in my country, in Nigeria, but that's where I come from. We have uh, farm slaves in the northern part of Nigeria, which was known as Bauer. And then we also have uh, traditional slavery practices in the Yoruba aspect, which is the West, which, in, uh, which was known as the Ejie Orisa, which actually means food for the gods. So in other words, this kind of slaves were sacrificed to the gods. Then we have also the Yalas in Cross River, which is to the, towards the east. And I'm sure I've heard of the Osu caste system in Igbo land. It's still on to today. So it wasn't, this is slavery, it's not a new invention. It didn't just happen. So slaves were either gotten um, as captives of wars between kingdoms, because we had several kingdoms in Nigeria. We had the Benin kingdom and other kingdoms in the north. Or people were made slaves as a form of punishment, you know, for crimes they committed. There were also domestic slaves, military slaves, or pawn slaves, which I like to call uh, trade by barter slaves. So in other words, if, for example, we have uh, a kind of, I want uh, something from you, we are trading, I could give you somebody in exchange for some goods. So these are kind of the kind of slavery we had. These practices then, uh, maybe uh, I'd, can be described as long life practice with the servant perpet perpetually under the master's order, yet without remuneration, except that they or their fellow bearers were acquired with. So um, I tried digging um, deeper into the history and I came across the works of uh, Wanze. He wrote this in 2004. He said, Africa as a continent bled from slavery for 14 centuries, 10 to the Arab world and another four to the Western world. 
He goes on to state that one thing the Arabs and the West had in common was the use of religion, so either Islam or Christianity, to justify trading in people. The Arabs and the Europeans or Americans did, however, have fundamental differences which bordered on racism. While Arabs mainly wanted domestic servants, soldiers, and ox for their harems, the Europeans, on the other hand, were industrial in their demands, and they wanted the slaves to use in making money. Arab slaves could adopt Islam, and their kids, their kids would not be slaves. Whereas the Europeans, or the Americans, believed in chattel slaves. A chattel slave was owned everlastingly and includes the slave's children and children's children. The uh, transatlantic slave trade from Africa uh, into another continent lasted for about 3,000 years through the involvement of West African trading kings and chiefs. Nigerians initially sold their slaves to the slave masters. But as the business became more lucrative and profitable, freeborns, that people who were not slaves, were also sl uh, sold into slavery. Wanze aptly described this process when he states that people who were given to the slaves were victims of wars or raids, or in a few pathetic cases, a fulefu, which usually means a useless person, you know, somebody who is mentally sick or retarded. So those kind of people were the ones that were sent, given away as slaves. This was made e easier with the help, support, and encouragement of the Europeans. Armed with the European weapons, carried out raids among neighboring tribes uh, to obtain captives whom they could sell to the Portuguese uh, in exchange for more manufactured goods uh, such as gun, clothes, mirrors. In fact, I know in my part of um, Nigeria, which is the south, uh, southern part there is so close to the river because you see when you talk about Niger Delta it's just next to the the the, the, the bites you know so we the, the the way we dress we wear even pajamas which is what is known as pajamas today is PJs for men here as regal outfits so these are just some of the things we acquired from the European um, sailors and slave masters we things having things like during um uh, festivals we would carry things like swords and mirrors you know and we wear some of these things on our body and as this, as a kind of traditional outfit but uh, it was something that we we never knew we never manufactured it but we got this as gifts and we're excited so you could exchange a human being for a mere mirror or a mere pair of pajamas so, um, the role of our people, my people, in kidnapping, degrading, and then enslaving their own fellow people stays with us to date. The lack of trust amongst our people was what made it easy for Africa to be colonized, as they found once again willing collaborators amongst the Africans. Um, the Industrial Revolution brought about increased production and productivity. And in order for producers to be able to meet up with the fast-paced demands of the industrial era, there was a need for a new form of capital, which came in the form of that chattel slaves I mentioned earlier. According to Williams, 1944, he says, Eric Williams, slavery helped finance the industrial revolution in England. Plantation shipbuilders and merchants connected with the slave trade accumulated vast fortunes that established banks and heavy industry in Europe and expanded the reach of capitalism worldwide. Slavery was basically an economic venture. The reasons for slavery, according to Wakefield, uh, he says, are not moral, but economic circumstances. They relate not to vice and virtue, but to production. Slavery was not the preferred choice of labor during the 16th century. However, due to the low population of, of able-bodied laborers, which were needed to work on the farms and plantations, cultivating staple foods such as cotton, sugar, and tobacco, slavery became a necessary cheap and productive labor. 
1808, the United Kingdom's Parliament passed the Slave Trade Act of 1807, which forbid the engagement in slave trade, but not of slavery itself. This Slave Trade Act brought about some form of eradication of slavery, as slavery did not represent the principle of free labor. This, however, did not bring about, um, there was still, after, even after the 19th century, where there's still residues of slavery on local, regional, and international scales. And so this, what you see today is now known as the modern day slavery. Bill in 2012 states that thousands of years people have been enslaved, but slavery never really disappeared. Rather, it took on a different form. The term modern day slavery is being used in the context of different practices of crimes such as trafficking in persons, forced labor, slavery, but also child labor, forced marriages, and others. The common denominator of these crimes is that they are all forms of exploitation in which one person is under the control of another. Slavery can be seen in almost every country of the world today, with women and children being forced into prostitution, to people forced to work in factories, domestic and agricultural work. Um, I know throughout the presentation, we hear me talking women, children, women, children. It doesn't exclude boys. Uh, usually boys call and girls come on their children. My work always uh, is, I always had been focusing on uh, women and children. And it doesn't mean that men are not also part of this, uh, vic are not victims of this slave trade. According to Simon, in distinguishing between modern slavery and transatlantic uh, trans, um, slave trade, he quotes, holding people in slave-like condition is far more profitable today than it was when the sale of human beings was conducted in open markets and slaveholders invested relatively large sums of money to buy and legally own people. Victims of modern day slavery are not legally owned but are controlled through coercion, threats, and violence. He states that people trafficked in the, in the 21st century are, cons are considered less valuable. They are now disposable, easily replaceable, and cheap. Contrary to common misconceptions that slavery affects everyone, some groups of people are much more susceptible to slavery than others. For example, uh, individuals who live in poverty and have limited opportunity to resources are more susceptible to accepting elusive job opportunities that can become exploit uh, exploitative. People who suffer discrimination and prejudice due to their gender, ethnicity, race, or caste are also likely to be subjugated to exploitation. Furthermore, modern day slavery is likely to occur in countries where corruption is the norm and the rule of law is weak. Where, wherever there are no laws or weak laws, evil thrives unabated. Where the, the law exists but the enforcement procedure is weak, it amounts to weak or no law. Several scholars have opined that human trafficking as a resumption of the slave trade is caused primarily, uh, primarily by a displacement of state organizations and international standards geared to control transnational population movements. There is no doubt that the root cause of modern day slavery is poverty and inequality of power. However, according to Abe, um, he says, globalization has intensified the problem. The increase of immigration from the east to the west of Europe has resulted in prostitution businesses breeding rapidly. Consequently, more and more women and children who are sexually exploited and abused have been victims of human trafficking. Human trafficking, as defined by Article 3 of the Protocol to Prevent, Suppress, and Punish Trafficking in Persons, 2000, is a trafficking in persons as the um, recruitment, transportation, transfer, harboring, or receipt of persons. 
by means of the threats or use of force or other forms of coercion, of abduction, of fraud, of deception, of the abuse of power or of a position of vulnerability, or of the giving and receiving of payments or benefits to achieve the consent of a person having control over another person for the purpose of exploitation. Exploitation includes, but it's not limited to forced labor, prostitution, sales of organs, servitude, sexual exploitation, you name it. So, people, I know I've mentioned human smuggling, human trafficking. People over often confuse human trafficking and human smuggling. Human smuggling is the illegal movement of people across borders, international borders, for a fee, or uh, domestic local borders, for a fee. On arrival, the smuggled person is free. Human trafficking is different. The trafficker is moving a person for exploitation. There is no need to cross international borders. Human trafficking occurs at national level or even within one community. People are often trafficked in order to channel them into exploitive forms of labor. The trafficked person is usually economically poor and they will accept and tolerate any kind of labor as long as they are paid. Oftentimes, smuggled migrants end up being victims of human trafficking because due to their desperation to migrate to another country, they are usually exploited by the smugglers who often uh, extort money from the migrants. The link between the smuggling operations and cases of trafficking is often unclear and blurry. Those who are unable to pay more to the smugglers may not reach their initial agreed country of destination. So um, I'm going to move on now to one of my, I call it the human smuggling or trafficking ring. It's, it's, I, got, I, I got this out from one of my publications. Okay. So I want you to know that human uh, Trafficking or human smuggling has, it's a very well organized crime and it's very well coordinated. And so I came up with this ring and then you can see in the center, we start with the recruiter. This is the first contact for the victim in the human smuggling or trafficking ring. The recruiter scouts for victims using manipulative or deceptive promises. They prey on victims' vulnerability and naivety. The recruiter could be a relative, it could be a close friend, or somebody from the same community or village as the victim. They work on the victim's psychic and lash in onto the victim's vulnerability, thereby preparing the groundwork of manipulating the victim. Most women are brought into prostitution under false pretenses that are often misled about working conditions at the destination countries. They will tell a woman, okay, oh, I could get you a job as a hairdresser. You have a salon here in Nigeria, but you could, get, you could make more money working as a hairdresser in Germany, for example. And so these are some of the ways you're preparing the person's mind. You're telling him there could be a better life for you. She wasn't planning on going anywhere. You're telling her that you're wasting your talent here, okay? These are grounds on which a person can be considered as trafficked. After, from the recruiter, we now move to the binders. Once the victim has agreed to go to Europe or wherever they have agreed to go, because I don't really know which particular country, there are so many countries they want to uh, go to outside of Africa. Um, whatever has been agreed between the victim and the recruiter, the victim is then taken to either juju priests in shrines or spiritualists and ritualists to perform what they call voodoo rites. The aim is to come to a binding agreement between the victim and the recruiter. The essence of this exercise is to ensure complete agreement and compliance. The witnesses are often the family members of the victim, so that in future, should the victim renegate on his or her part of the agreement, the family can equally be punished. 
voodoo is an essential element on how the human smuggling ring operates because the voodoo oath ensures that the smuggled or trafficked victim is obligated to repay the debts incurred while bringing the victim to the country of destination. After the binders, we have uh, the trolleys or coach. Human smugglers who are responsible for, they are the people who are responsible for the journey of taking the victim to where they, they promise to take them. They are also sometimes the main sponsors as they are responsible for the payments of the transportation of the victims, housing of the victims when necessary, payment for the forging of documents, uh, and uh, procurement of parts, passports, visa, etc. The sponsor is responsible for paying all costs of the journey and settling abroad. Every single last penny and more are carefully documented for the information and necessary action of the madam or the receiver at the destination country. The trolley, in addition to providing the logistics required for the movement of the victim, acts as a coach to the victims to ensure that how they to ensure how to ensure how they behave before the visa officers if you're going to get a visa, land and border officers if you're going to pass land um, borders, immigration officers and law enforcement officers to avoid detection by these agents. The victim is indebted to the trolley and are closely monitored by the madam and the pimp. We'll get to them in the case of prostitution. Um, these paybacks usually take several years. The victims are going to pay back once they get to their destination. And usually they incur huge and outrageous amounts. Many women do not understand the extent of what they are committing themselves to because they're not fully familiar, of course, with, let's say, uh, European currencies, American currencies. You know, so if somebody tells you, okay, when you get to, I'm going to use Germany <laughs> again, you get to Germany, they're going to pay us 50,000 euros. For her, she thinks 50,000 euros is 50,000 naira. It's not. And I wonder how many men are going to sleep with to pay off 50,000 euros and how many years. With the sponsor, it's, perce it's perceived as very strong by the trafficked women. First of all, they may fear breaking the pact. Could, they, could, they may fear breaking the pact could affect their physical and mental health through magic. Secondly, remember the voodoo we did before, so it's voodoo is some kind of magic. They believe in it. Secondly, the pact is often perceived not only as a promise to the other party, but to the local community in Nigeria. Breaking the pact represents much shame towards the entire community because remember that we also had witnesses when you went to do the voodoo. So if you break the pact, that means you are becoming a kind of non-conformist, you know, and of course you're putting your family back home in danger too. Um, the Nigerian trafficking networks often use human smugglers of other nationalities to transport the women to other parts of Europe and America. Now, we're going on to the madam. The madam is the most important person in the network in Nigeria. They are the main traffickers and the receivers of smuggled women and children. The madam in Europe is closely connected to the madam in Nigeria. Often, they will belong to the same extended family. The smuggler or trafficker is a link between the supply and the demand. On the one hand, increasing supply through the recruitment, deception, transportation, and exploitation process. And on the other hand, boosting demand by providing um, easy access to the trafficked persons. These includes recruiters as well as tramp transporters, receivers, pimps, brothel keepers, corrupt bodyguards, and producers of false documentation, all of whom benefit as the trafficked and smuggled persons passes through their hands. 
The smuggler or trafficker is often part of the extended family and has link with the family nucleus or is someone known within the local community. Smugglers or traffickers themselves often have the same fate in the magical powers of voodoo as the victims. Through um, a telephone interception um, done in 2003 by Prina during her own research, they found that Italian investigators have heard many examples of madams in Italy asking the madam in Nigeria to help with magical rituals to keep the police at a distance. So they believe that if they pray through their rituals in Nigeria, that the police would not detect them, even in Italy. It's a very powerful wood. <laughs> so the last one is the pimp. The pimp, just like the madam, in cases of prostitution and illegal jobs, ensures that the trafficked victims are obedient and they work hard to make money for the pimp. The pimps walk the streets and know the clients that need the services of the trafficked victims. The lives of the trafficked victims are controlled by the pimp, who in addition to monitoring the victim at their work site to ensure compliance, often subject the victims to physical and sexual violence and use of force when necessary in order to, in order to maximize profit from the uh, victim. The majority of smuggled victims in their naivety were certain that they would be given jobs and employment on arrival at their destination countries. Imagine their shock and disbelief when they find that they'll be working as prostitutes or in stringent conditions. I don't know if you understand what stringent conditions are. When you're leaving uh, a weather of 35 degrees and coming to a place and they, when it's minus zero, uh, minus one or minus two, and you're standing out there in the cold, that's punishment. That's hell. So, <laughs> so um, some traffic victims were aware they were working as prostitutes. However, they had no idea about the kind of harsh conditions they will be working in at their destination countries. In addition to keeping in line with the path they had made prior to coming to their destination country, women are subjected to various forms of abuse from their pimps and madams. Violent uh, assault is undoubtedly common, but neither a rule nor a necessity in the Nigerian model of human trafficking and smuggling. The, the psychological control the smugglers and traffickers have over the migrants often makes violence unnecessary. Uh, the indebtedness to the smugglers causes a potential risk in the country of destination. Migrants are often expected to pay back their debts as soon as they arrive their destination. As most migrants are not allowed to work while they undergo the asylum process, if enrolled, or cannot find jobs, the indebtedness causes great distress to these migrants, especially because smugglers often contact the families at homes and threaten them at their home in Nigeria, back home in Nigeria, and threaten them as well. So, um, for moving on now, let's go to the main thing we came here to do today the methods and approaches in doing human trafficking and smuggling in Nigeria. I know most of you here are doing, um, engaging in this kind of research, but um, I just want you to, to know that it's doing this kind of research is a very difficult, it's very difficult for several reasons, I will elucidate them. Um, but there's one thing that you should know as a researcher engaging in human trafficking and human smuggling research, there's always the element of risk involved. Because human smuggling and human trafficking is an organized crime. It's a very big business, it's a flourishing business, and there are people who have, who have vested interests who wouldn't want to be exposed. It's almost like a mafia-like kind of uh, uh, thing. So when you engage in this kind of research, you have to take every uh, uh, precaution. You know, don't go in blindly. Don't start asking questions just like that. You need to, most times, the best way for me, I always tell people this, always use a mediator. In other words, don't go and scout your victims yourself. You go through maybe an NGO, a civil society agency, things like that. You know, um, 
they can now put you in touch with these uh, victims so you can use them as your respondents. But you do also re realize that you can't get a large number of respondents when you're doing this kind of research. I couldn't get a room full like this of women and children who are, uh, you know, victims of uh, human trafficking. You can't get them in one go. Sometimes you're lucky um, because perhaps you can get them if they if they are being rehabilitated by some uh, agency and maybe where they're having training. You could there you could get a large number to maybe do engage in focus group discussion. But we'll, we'll, we'll talk about this as I go on. So doing research into human trafficking and human smuggling in a country like Nigeria hmm, can be very daunting considering the depth of data and, and the large population of the country as well as the criminal and sensitive nature of the subject matter. Uh, if you, as you all know, Nigeria has a population of over 200 million people, but the largest in Africa. And um, we don't keep data, they don't. The only agency uh, called NAPTIB, the National Agency for the Prohibition of Trafficking in Person, they are the only ones that have some kind of data, but the kind of data they have is mostly of cases of persecution, and the persecution rates are very low. So that's a discussion for another day. In doing research and, uh, on human trafficking and human smuggling, the methodologies and research design is often chosen according to the kind of access the researcher will have at field. Research on human trafficking and human smuggling are often difficult because of the criminal nature of the phenomenon. The study population are often hidden and the sensitivity of the subject matter and the stigma often attached to people who are victims of human smuggling or trafficking. So you have to always bear this in mind. Um, in order to achieve the objective of research um, of this nature, due to lack of data, I often employ qualitative uh, research method because it has the ability to deepen the subject of inquiry. Here, the non-numerical data that and works are collected and interpreted. This is the best way to understand social life through the study of the targeted populations. Uh, such a qualitative method of data collection include, but not limited to, oral interviews, open-ended surveys, focus group discussions, content analysis of, of visual and textual materials, oral history, and the rest. <laughs> In order to gain access to the victims, it's normally through mediators, such as civil society organizations and agencies involved in the protection and rehabilitation of such victims. For example, I mentioned earlier the National Agency for the Prohibition of Trafficking in Persons in Nigeria. They have the functions, they were, they were founded by the government and they have the function of investigating all cases of trafficking in persons, including forced labor, child labor, forced prostitution, and other forms of exploitation. Um, they also uh, have the mandate of, protect, of the protection, assistance, and rehabilitation of trafficked persons. In, in, in cases like this, you now do what's called purposive sampling technique. You're going to deliberately, purposely select these people because remember, we want to get information from people who have been trafficked. We're not just going to see anybody on the street and say, hey, what do you think about human trafficking? No, we don't want to interest it. If you want the real life experience, you need to be, have access to these victims. Um, secondary sources, sources which include also the mediators, can be very, uh, very uh, valuable sources of information. However, they cannot give you detailed information as human traffic or smuggling victims would give you. Do you understand? They didn't leave this experience. They, they heard. They, they, they hear what the the victims tell them. So sometimes, nice to hear firsthand from the victims if you are able to. Other approaches we, we, in, we, we could do in, in when we're doing our analysis, we could use the historical model, we could also use the narrative model, or grounded theory method, or ethnographic model. Um, 
The historical method of qualitative research describes past events in order to understand present patterns and anticipate future choices. This model um, answers questions based on a hypothetical idea and then uses resources to test the idea for any potential deviations. The narrative model occurs over extended periods of time and we here it comp uh, compiles information as it happens. Like a story narrative, it takes subjects at a starting point and reviews situations as up uh, obstacles or opportunities, although the final narrative doesn't always remain in the chronological order. So we have the grounded theory method, we could use that, where we'll try to explain why a cause of action evolved the way it did. It did. There is also the ethnographic model, that's the most popular one and widely recognized method of qualitative research, because it measures subjects in a culture that's unfamiliar to them. The goal is to learn and describe the culture's characteristics, much the same way anthropologists observe the cultural challenges and motivations that drive a group. This method often immerses, immerses this researcher as a subject for extended periods of time. Um, we would go on to ethical issues in doing research on human trafficking and smuggling, but before then, let's just look at some examples of narrative examples of human trafficking and uh, human smuggling. So um, I didn't. I don't know if it was very clear. If you understood, if you could see what was written on there, because sometimes she would speak from English. She's going to what called pidgin English. So yeah, and to me. So but so this is somebody who was who. This is a case example of a human trafficking case um, because she was told she could uh, get a job and uh, also also school when she comes here uh, abroad. But unfortunately, it wasn't what happened. And she didn't pay a dime. The man said they told her. He told he they told her um, that when you get there, you can send anything you want. You know, something like that. So she just she was naive. For example, um, <clears throat> this I, I did a job with last year, uh, early last year. With uh, I was I was a, a subject matter expert on um, human trafficking in Nigeria. So I worked with a group called Art Group in uh, the UK. They were trying to do, wanted to know why um, we're looking at irregular migration from Nigeria to UK, and so we're looking at some of the factors, why people are moving, and we had to also work with lots of civil society organizations, and so that's how I came about some of these materials, because... Um, we, they did the interview. They were trying to, at the end of, I think the end of that project was to try and do uh, an awareness campaign telling people that it's not what you think. We feel, they, they felt that, because many of these people who are trafficked, they are educated. Some are even university graduates, but they are unemployed too. And then somebody is telling you, oh, you're here suffering and there's a job out there waiting for you. So they, they, they were trying, the UK government <laughs> is trying to, you know, do some campaigns and working very strongly with, um, with, most of the agencies that I that deal with uh, human trafficking victims. Now, this one is a narrative of human smuggling. Yeah, so <clears throat> this person obviously paid somebody to smuggle him from Nigeria. They passed through the desert, passed through Niger. They got to Libya to try and get to Europe. Halfway through the journey, the man says. The money he paid is has expired. So in other words, when they tell you it's expired, that means we're leaving you here in the middle of what nowhere. And so he had to call his uh, sister who is married and her husband and said, "Oh, that the trafficker says and uh, the smuggler says the amount we paid it has expired." And his sister screamed again, "Why are you always getting into wrong hands?" So I think he has done this journey once and he didn't succeed, and it's happening again. And so um, they did. The husband now said, "Okay, how much is he asking for?" And he says, "Okay, it's an ex uh, extra two hundred thousand naira." And so they sent the money to his account, and he paid. So, of course, you, you can see he's in Nigeria. So that means he didn't really get to his destination country, because I, the Nigerian government actually rescued some many Nigerians from Libya who are, you know, kept as captives. They didn't even 
uh, succeed in crossing the perilous uh, Mediterranean seas. So um, there are some ethical issues we should consider when uh, doing research on human trafficking and smuggling. Um, um, because uh, this kind of human trafficking and smuggling oftentimes involves sexual exploitation, where we have people engaging in sex work or prostitution. There's a question of the ethics involved when doing this research. For example, victims are seen as vulnerable, and broaching such sensitive subjects could be traumatizing for the victims. I don't know if you observed in the video, you could see the, in the female one, she didn't want uh, to be seen. So they had to darken that video. But the man, of course, they didn't care. Usually men, you know, they're, they're not so... Uh, the women are ashamed because it's a patriarchal society and uh, it's embarrassing to, you know, say, oh, I was raped, so oh, I slept with 500 men or things like that. So, yeah. And usually, most of the people, since they're traumatized, you have to think about the kind, how you're going to broach uh, some of these subjects, the questions you want to ask, how you're going to go around it. The issue of uh, um, confidentiality is something that's often considered because, especially when you're dealing with this kind of uh, criminal activities, Sometimes before you start this uh, you know, asking questions or engaging in a focus group discussion, the respondent should be asked to sign consent forms, uh, which will allow the researcher to use the information gotten from field. Um, this consent could be will also be orally, and the orally said, agreed upon, and written. And. Um, and then you do not re uh, release the uh, identity of the uh, respondent unless they give you their consent, you know, for the identity to be released. Um, of course, you do know that people who engage in this kind of research too are also psychologically affected. Um, and sometimes it can be very difficult to process um, and it, at the same time narrate the victim's story. I remember that there was once I was doing research in um, uh, Port Harcourt City, where I live, and um, I went to some uh, brothels in the city there, and I was shocked to find in a one particular brothel that the youngest uh, victim, trafficked victim, was 14, 15 years old. And they were all housed in this hotel, and they had, and somebody was coming. Men were coming and patronizing that kind of um, that kind of place, you know. Because uh, in 2007, my PhD um, my PhD work was on research was on prostitution. I had gone in that part of town too. I had gone to hotels in those days to get respondents, and they were all adult women, you know. I mean, women of their ages of age of consent, 18 and above. So. Fast forward like 10 years later, now you're not seeing women, you're seeing little children. And so I, there seems to be this shift in dynamics and in the, in the age range of, you know, uh, people trafficked uh, victims. I think the taste, when it comes to sexual exploitation, the taste of men has changed from older to the younger, and we don't know how far they would go. And it, since there's always there's the demand, there's always the supply for those kind of things. So as uh, for me as a mother, I was just imagining, oh, this girl could be my daughter, you know, or this boy could be my son. So I, I kind of felt psychologically affected. If you're a woman and a woman is telling you, I mean, I'm not a psychologist, is telling you, oh, how she was brutally raped and this, and you, it affects you as a researcher. But um, these things should also be considered. Then you have to also look at, most times people say you that. Uh, is it could be information gotten if, if you pay the respondents will would such uh, um, information be considered valid 
Well, for me, I don't pay my respondents any money. Um, I'm not saying that if I go to see them and the weather is very hot, I wouldn't buy them some soft drinks because I'll be taking a soft drink myself. I'm drinking Coke and I have to buy a Fanta. So, but to pay, I do not pay because I need to be sure that I'm getting the right information that you're not giving me, telling me what I want to hear. You also find that when you're engaging in focus group discussion, for example, women tend to want to talk to women. If the, the researcher is a male, the women would not say so much to you. So it's always best if you're, you're a male researcher doing this kind of work to have maybe a female colleague or an assistant who would not be the one to, you can, of course you have what you've written and the kind of questions you want and of course they're recording it. So you do, you, you, you have to step back a little if you really want to get the kind of information that will be very useful in understanding certain um, um, criteriums. And so I stop here. Thank you for your attention.